This conversation between Christopher Paolini and Brandon Sanderson was part of TourCon, a four-day virtual convention held by Tour Books and Den of Geek in June, featuring panels with some of speculative fiction's most exciting authors. Christopher Paolini's next book is Space Opera Tome, To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. To Sleep in a Sea of Stars is the story of xenobiologist Kira Navarez, who finds an alien relic during a routine survey mission on an uncolonized planet. The relic thrusts Kira into the wonders and nightmares of first contact, and into an adventure that will change the entire course of history. It is enormous. Uh, which is always a big plus in my book. Yeah, it's it's the biggest published book I've done. It's I you'll you'll laugh at it because you're quite a bit beyond this, but it's a uh, three hundred nine thousand words. So it's it's a big that boy. It's enormous. Um, yeah, like uh, that's the sort of thing when I opened it up, saw how big it was, I went, oh, <laughs> what are you doing is it? Yeah. Well, the goal was actually to write an entire series in one book because I've done the multi-book series with over a million published words, and uh, I've admired authors like yourself who are doing, you know, the, I mean, I think you kind of hold the record for the biggest of the big series at the moment. But, Maybe. Um, but I wanted to tell a complete story with a beginning, middle, and end in one volume because uh, it was a personal challenge, and I thought it was going to save me time instead of spending 10 years writing a series, but it took me nearly 10 years to write the, the, the darn <laughs> thing anyway. Again, because I was coming off of fantasy, I was very determined with To Sleep in a Sea of Stars to not overwrite it and to not info dump, not explain. I was going to just start, you know, in the middle of the scene and just go with the world and let it come out through context. Very much a C.J. Cherry approach to the science fiction. So anyway, I did that, and this book has had a very long revision history. The first draft didn't work. I basically, I made promises to the readers that were not fulfilled by the story. And I was uh, revising and it was just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. And ultimately I did a good job of rearranging the deck chairs, but it, the Titanic was still sinking. And uh, back in 20, end of 2017, my editor and uh, then, then editor and agent said, you know, we love you dearly. This is not working. You either gonna have to rethink it entirely or write a new book. And they were completely right. And I hated to give up on it. So I, I wrote 200 pages of notes in a week and a half by hand and figured out the promises I'd been making to the reader that I wasn't fulfilling and all the other issues that were going on. And then went into the revision and rewriting and basically wrote a new book. Uh, but the, anyway, the point of this is when I delivered the manuscript to Tor, the version they read and everything, it was about 275,000 words. Now, normally, I'm like you. I drop 10% during editing. I went from 275,000 words at Davy's um, guidance to 309,000 words. I have never in my life gone into editing and come out, what, 30, 40,000 words longer. When transferring from a fantasy to science fiction, what was the hardest thing to write about in regards of your world, world building? Ooh, great question. Um, it's not world building, but getting to use more modern language was a wonderful thing, and I thoroughly enjoyed it because I severely limited my vocabulary when writing fantasy because there are things, and, and I was never perfect with this, but there are things you don't really want to say, like the word you car. You can't on the Ottoman, right? Bing, you can't bingo. call it an Ottoman. Um, I mean, you technically could, but it's going to boot some readers out if they're like, wait a minute, they're an Ottoman Empire? In your, uh, yeah. Bingo. Um, but actually, from a world building standpoint, uh, it, was the, it was the technology, you know, which is essentially the magic system for science fiction. And I went to great lengths to not only make it internally consistent, but as externally consistent as I could, which I didn't have to, but I wanted to. And the reason for this was uh, I wanted a system of faster than light travel that allowed for faster than light travel, but didn't contradict physics as we know it, that didn't allow for time travel the way that Star Trek's, you know, uh, FTL system allows for, and had not been used by any other science fiction story that I was aware of. Uh, now, the, the FTL that I came up with, that took about a year of work of thinking and the other technology. It has some outward trappings like some other systems uh, that we may see, but the, the technical things are very different. 
Uh, and that's actually explained in some of the terminology in the back. But it, the, from a writing standpoint, what was difficult is when you're doing fantasy, if you need to get to from point A to point B a little faster than normal, you can always say the characters dug their spurs in a little bit harder. They whipped the horses a little bit more. And you, you can, or the, the character themselves ran to the limits of human or elven endurance. You know, you, you have a little bit of wiggle room. But spaceships, you know, machines don't really, um, especially if you're trying to be a little realistic with the physics. You know, a, a spaceship can go just about as fast as it can go, and that's it. So um, in terms of mechanics with this plot, it puts some real limitations on it, which I enjoyed. You're reading, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm a big fan of maps. And so for every section in the book, there's going to be a different map, uh, some of which I made and some of which my assistant made. I was going to ask you if you did any art for this. There are because uh, I don't have any art in mind. Oh man, I'll send you some. There are seven maps in the yeah. book, and there are logos and other things in the back, and going to be on the cover. And I'm going to I'm going to be completely upfront with this. I was directly inspired by The Way of Kings because when I was a kid reading books, I remember we had a set of the Nancy Drew books, and they were illustrated, full color paintings in the Nancy Drew books. And that just dragged me through the books, and I loved getting to those 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 rewards with those images in the book. And I remember when I picked up Way of Kings, I was like, someone did it, someone did it. Uh, and I love that so much that uh, it's something I've instituted here with To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. I, I love hearing that. Uh, one of the things I want to do is I'm like, let's bring more artwork back yeah. to adult books. Um, we just do not have enough cool art going on. We've relegated that to the, to the children's market for whatever reason. And... Um, you know, uh, I, I I missed it. So, can, can I can I can I give you a fantasy pun? Just just one sure, small fantasy ahead. pun. Do you know why it's Do you know why it's so often hard to talk to dragon riders? Hmm. No. Why is that? Because they usually have their heads in the clouds. Ah, yeah. <laughs> That's terrible. Thank That's you. Really terrible. Thank you. My 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 agent hates my puns, and so I mm. I, uh, I I inflict them on him with regularity.